So, uh, should we talk about our conversation in the studio the other day with uh, one of our contractors? Yeah, the uh, one Saturday morning. So, uh, <clears throat> so yesterday, one of our, um, our video production team members uh, asked us a question uh, about uh, this COVID-19 um, disease that's going around as a result of the, the, the coronavirus, this new coronavirus. And, um, and they asked, uh, is it true that Bill Gates owns the coronavirus? Apparently, there was a rumor going around that Bill Gates owns the coronavirus, which well, he owns everything else, right? Okay, right, so, yeah, yeah. right. I, I think I think yeah. most people, when they hear that, they would just kind of laugh and think that 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 concept is ridiculous. But then again, maybe not, um, because it's you know, IP, IP rights are can get pretty abstract, and and you know what can be patented and what can't be patented um, is sometimes uh, unclear to the average person, right? Yeah, actually. Patent rights are anything but abstract. However, I think you're absolutely right when you say it's unclear what people own and what they don't know. People really don't understand what these patents are, right? And when this person, who, by the way, is a very smart person who raised this question, which had both of us kind of think, oh, maybe we better check this out. Because this is a smart person, we said, you know, th the answer is this. No, Bill Gates does not own this coronavirus, right? But here's why. It's not that he can't. And he, but here's why. Anything that's found in nature that's naturally occurring cannot be owned by patent. But if it's man-made, it can be. So if a virus is modified in some way, that can be owned by somebody. If it's, so, so yes, you can own human intervened viruses and strains. And by the way, I am absolutely not an expert on, on uh, intellectual property associated with viruses. But I know the basics, and that is, if it's naturally occurring, you cannot own it. But if it's man-made, you can. So there could be a man-made modification of it that can be owned. As well, you can own testing for it. You develop a unique, you know, a new, uh, useful and non-obvious uh, tool or kit or method for testing for coronavirus. That can be, you know, owned. Also, maybe an application for it. Who knows? Maybe somebody figures out how to use coronavirus to grow hair. You know, uh, that'd be good for me. Maybe not so much for you, but that'd be good for me. So that could be owned. So anything you build, anything mankind builds around it, you can own that, but not the actual coronavirus. Because from what I understand, this is totally naturally occurring. Right. So Unless conspiracy theorists are correct. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's conspiracy theories out there, and, <laughs> but we're, we're not going to get into speculating about any of those. Uh, right. Other right. than the yeah. does Bill Gates own the virus one, because that one's pretty easy to debunk. Um, right. But, right. but so, OK, so that, that does open up uh, my other question, which which was, um, you know, I've been paying attention to the news um, more than usual the last couple of weeks. I, and, I, and I noticed that uh, just the other day, uh, the president had several CEOs of, of different companies, a couple uh, of the big testing companies, other, other, other medical device uh, companies. And uh, it seems as though, um, you know, uh, again, I don't know the specific details of this, but it seems as though there's a lot of private industry uh, stepping in to partner with um, our, our governmental organizations here um, to, uh, to, to create uh, tools, I think specifically testing, um, that, that are going to be used. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can explain what you know a little bit more about um, uh, uh, IP rights when, when, um, when engineering is, is uh, funded by, by a, a research and development is funded by government grants and, and how those kind of relationships with the government and the private sector work when it comes to IP rights. Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Now, first thing I'll say is, if anyone were to ask me that in real life, you know, they had a question about who owns these rights in connection with government funded projects. And believe me, there's going to be a lot of those questions because I, I guess there's a fortune being put into this now. But first thing I'd ask is, let me see the documents, right? Because documents typically define who owns what. Uh, and you could pay for something and still not own it because, again, innovators own the right to intellectual property short of an agreement that says otherwise. Now, these government contracts typically, they're very thorough because the government does this all the time, right? So they typically break out rights 
And there's like, I'm just going to say four different types of rights that typically occur. And I'm not a, not a guru on this, but I did create a training program on this. And those are government could have limited rights. They could have unlimited rights. They could have something called restricted rights and they could have something called government purpose rights. So without getting too complicated, if you create something in connection with a, or outside of a government contract, you bring it into the deal but it's part of the solution. So you develop it with your own funding, 100% raised funding to develop something, but Ray uses it in connection with this project and to, for the ultimate solution. The government would have limited rights to that, right? So they have the right to use it, certainly in connection with the solution that you've delivered, but they wouldn't be able to use it to reprocure outside of their relationship with you. So you'd be able to protect your your rights to what you developed first, but they would have they would have uh, you know rights to use it in connection with your project. The other extreme to that is unlimited rights, and unlimited rights are scary. Those are rights associated with the project that is solely funded by the government. So let's say that you come with your hands empty. Government gives you a million dollars, and you have to produce something, and you do, and then you deliver it. Those would be unlimited rights to the government, which means they could use your the technology that you can you still own it by the way you own the patent right you own patents that come out of it regardless of whether it's limited or unlimited rights but they have unlimited rights which means they can take that final solution and go to a lower cost manufacturer hmm. and get them to produce everything instead of you so let's say you develop it and you want to tool up your manufacturing and you want to make a fortune off of ongoing purchases from the government. So they give you a million dollars, you develop this technology, and then you go to bid on the contract that comes out of it and they use the technology that you've developed with respect to another vendor and you're cut out. They can do that with respect to their unlimited rights and that's when they fund it everything, okay? So, so there's limited, which is, what you funded, you brought to the party in your hand stuff. There's unlimited what you came empty handed and they paid you to develop everything. Those are the first two. Do you have any questions about that? I do, I but is there, <laughs> wait, there's a, is there a part three to this? Yeah, there's also two other forms of rights. Okay. And there might be other rights as well, but these are the basic rights. There's something called restricted rights. Now restricted rights are the same as limited rights, except in connection with software. So let's say you develop software for the government and you deliver your final product, but you had some software before you started and they funded the development of some. When you delivered it, you have to clearly delineate which code was from your previous development and which was not. To the extent that it was your previous development, you would only have to give up limited rights to the government, but to the extent that it was not or to the extent that you couldn't prove that it was, you'd have to give up unlimited rights to the government. And then there's this other thing which is called government purpose rights. And I think those are only available for deals with the Department of Defense. And I'm pretty sure the way that works is if you co-invested. So you co-invest in something, you pay, they pay, and you develop something great, then it's government purpose rights, which are somewhere in between limited and unlimited, but they're much closer to unlimited than limited. So when people are delivering stuff under these contracts, they're trying very hard to make sure that every document that has previously developed stuff on it is marked with unlim or with limited rights. Because if it's not marked, you miss one marking on something you developed first and they get unlimited rights in it. And that's pretty scary because now you're giving up potentially trade secrets to the government who can then give them to another company to compete against you with respect to that government contract. So, okay, so um, in, well, I guess any of these scenarios, um, pretty much any form of intellectual property is at play, right? Yeah, now the, uh, the ownership of the patents is still resides with the company being funded. So let's call it a contract, let's call it Ray. You still own the patent rights, but what you're giving up are rights to the patent, to the technology, right? So you own the patents, but you are giving the government unlimited rights. If it's unlimited rights, you're giving them worldwide, non-exclusive, 
unlimited rights to your patented technology, which they can then use to license out to other people to develop those products. So, so if I, so then in that case, if I just figured out, you know, uh, how, a, a way to make these tests, uh, mass produce these tests at half the price of whatever the next best uh, is doing, the next best company is doing, but at the same quality, right? I can right. go to the government and lay out my plans and take all of their business away, theoretically. Wait, wait. So let me make so. Like if, I, saying, if I could compete with a company that was that uh, that was currently had a government. So if if oh, if, I see what you're saying. If you if you, you have a government make, contract yeah. and you have a patent and you're producing this patented product, uh, you know that's funded by the government, but they have the rights to take it somewhere Un else. I can easily, rights. I can, unlimited rights. I could easily just go through the portfolio of government contracts, find you know, see which ones I could do better and just try to step in and compete with any of these companies, right? It's sort of like a- Cheaper. It's an open better, market. When you say better, you really mean cheaper, right? Uh, because I well, see better, what you're saying. Better, yeah. faster, or cheaper, right? I mean- But in this case, probably not better because what you're saying is you, Ray, developed technology that was 100% funded by the government. You develop, turn your technology over to the government. You own patent rights in that, but the government has unlimited rights to use it right? And they can re-procure with some other company. So if you find a company that can do it better, that means they probably have intellectual property rights and they're going to do it their own way. But, you're set, but they could do it cheaper than you. So they could take your exact, you know, patented method or, or process or tool, and they can figure out a way to deliver it to the government a lot cheaper than the government can go with them. That's and that's one of the I don't quite understand why, why, what, what you mean by what, if it wouldn't be better. Well, typically when you say, because what do you need to sell? You need to be better, faster, and cheaper. And intellectual property plays a role in all those things. It essentially puts the er in better, faster, and cheaper, right? Yeah. Because now you can keep people out. So I'm saying that if this other company could do it better, you come up with a test and they could do it better, they're probably doing it differently. Because if they're doing it the exact same way, it's not better. It's just good, right? Right. But if they're, if they're doing it differently, it's probably a different way, and they're getting their own intellectual property protection right. on it. Right. They would have had to have innovate on the process or the to make it somewhere. better, right? Yeah. Exactly. That's why I'm saying it, what you're thinking of is cheaper. That's an interesting idea, though. I've never thought of that, and it almost seems like um, I don't know. It's pretty cool because what you're saying is do a search on all the contracts where the government has unlimited rights to technology. Yeah. And if you could do it cheaper, and I'm sure people much smarter than us and yeah, I'm sure there are tons of big corporations are doing out that, there right? yeah, that are doing that. Um, right. But the key so, thing there, Ray, is with what companies worry about and they get nervous about is marking their documents. Because if you don't mark every single technical deliverable, every page with what you own as as, and you're only giving up limited rights versus unlimited rights versus government purpose rights or restricted rights, you have to mark that. And if you fail to mark it, the presumption is it's unlimited rights. So you could make a big blunder if you're with a small contractor who doesn't know any of these things and you turn over documents after you actually brought the technology to the table, you could lose your trade secrets. You could lose your unlimited rights to your own patented technology and they could go out and use it with other companies. That's why marking is so important. If you right. only have to give up limited rights, you want to mark it that way. Now, now does the government, um, does the government shop around when they have these contracts? You know, do they, do they ever go to other, like would they, would they go to a competitor of their own volition to try to find someone to give them a better deal? Is there like a process? It's a good question. I don't know. I'm, you'd think, intuitively, you'd think they would to get better prices, right? But who knows? Maybe there's relationships involved in that or huh. who knows? I don't know. Huh. But yeah, so, so, so yeah. So anyway, I do want to make sure that before we wrap up, I want to make sure that I give three tips for um, coronavirus and how to prevent. Because what did we do this weekend? We were shooting a program on coronavirus and this coronavirus, I mean, coronavirus is kind of a generic term, but this coronavirus and COVID-19. 
So we learned a few things about how to prevent, you know, infection, you know, how to like, reduce your chance at least to get infection. And there's like three basic things you can do. You want to know what those are? Yes. Okay. One thing is wash your hands with soap. Wash your hands with soap. Like I was out, you know, doing what everyone else in the country was doing recently, shopping before we're maybe quarantined and disinfectant. You're at, what do they call it? Or the uh, hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer is like gone. But the thing is, if it doesn't have at least 60% alcohol, it's not even useful against um, coronavirus. And it's, even if it does have 60% alcohol, it's not as useful as soap. So big thing is wash your hands regularly throughout the day with soap and water. And the thing is do it vigorously for like 20 seconds at least. And that is washing all over your hands vigorously with soap and water for 20 seconds at least after you do anything. So 20 times a day. So what I did is I bought a bunch of bars of soap and put them in all of our sinks. So my kids and I are constantly washing our hands. The second thing is don't do what you just did. And I know you did it just to set me up, didn't you? <laughs> don't touch your face. See, I have wanted to touch my face like 15 times during this podcast. I feel itches like all over and I have given in at least twice, but don't touch your face, fight the urge. Why? Why? Because if your hands get coronavirus on them, you're not infected necessarily. It's only when you touch your face, you touch your eye, rub your eyes, you touch, put something in your mouth, scratch the mucus membranes on your face. I know now everyone's like, what? I got to touch my face. So what I would do if I want to scratch face my face. more itchy the more you think about it. <laughs> I know. So that's the second thing is don't touch your face. Now, there's a bunch of things, but those are big too. And the other thing is stay away from people. You know, I mean, seriously, stay away from people. I walked, I, I was at, I bought my daughter a house recently and we're rehabbing it. And yesterday we're, I, I'm walking in and I meet, see some neighbors out front. So I wave, say hello, they come over and we all kind of agreed we can't shake hands. You know, the yeah. handshake might be gone forever. I don't know. But you know, don't go near large, large crowds because what happens is even if people exhale, there's like these droplets that get on you. And if they get on your face, big problem. If they get on your hand and you wash your hands, it's probably okay. But, you know, so stay away from, stay away from people. Stay away from big crowds in particular. And you just touched your I face. know. I know. It's so, it's impulse. Well, 2020 yeah. is the year that the handshake died. For, will forever yes. be known as the year that the handshake died. Yes. Yes. You are so right. way to bring in the decade. And I hope there's no decade where painted brick on fireplaces dies because we've been doing a lot of painting of brick on fireplaces. And I was joking with my daughter that in five years, people are going to be saying, why would you ever paint brick on a fireplace? So this is the year that the handshake died. And hopefully it'll be long after we've sold this house <laughs> that the painted fireplaces die. But anyway, so that's it. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. And Stay away from people. Yeah, and uh, conspiracy theories, too. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching. If you liked this episode of Stuff You Should Know About IP, please click the subscribe button, like, comment, and share it with your friends. We'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye.